our eternal Father, we give you praise and glorify your name for the beginning of yet another month. We thank you for all of your faithfulness in all of the days of this year. And Lord, that we have just two months remaining this year, we give you glory and honor for your faithfulness. We celebrate you. The Lord, in the midst of evil, in the midst of banditry, in the midst of all of the things that have converged upon Nigeria, Father, you have preserved a people. And Lord, you have numbered us amongst them. We return all the glory and the honor unto you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you tonight for as far as you have brought us. And we magnify your name, O oh God, in the series of teachings that you have started with us. We thank you, mighty and everlasting Father, because just before the meeting, Father God gave me a peep of what he was about to do. And we're excited already. Mighty Father of glory, we pray, Father of glory, that Lord, there will be easy dissemination. Mighty Father, we come with ears to hear. We come, oh God, with attentive hearts. And we thank you because the things that we will hear, they will stand us in good stead even for the callings of our different lives, O oh Lord. As Lord, you send us to the nations as your ambassadors and ministers in the name of the Lord Jesus. We give you all the praise and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, we are praying. As touching Nigeria, we say, who is it that speaks when the Lord has not spoken? Who speaks and it cometh to pass? And even though, Lord, our president may have traveled out according to the script, mighty Father of glory, we as your elect and your people in this land, we declare that, oh Lord, that we declare, oh Lord, that the counsel of the enemy shall not come to pass Amen. in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, because you will bring Amen. forth upon this nation as you make your highways, oh God even to level the mountains, O Lord of glory, and to lift up, O God, the body, the Lord, you will show us mercy. Thank you because our warfare is accomplished. Thank you, Father of glory, because you will break forth, O Lord of glory, upon this nation, even to present and to give unto us the new Nigeria. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father of glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. I was just taking up there. Thank God. Dr. Kayade, over to you, sir. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So sorry, my, uh, I think my central internet system just went off. So I, oh, wow. I don't know, and there's light, I don't know, but it's okay. I have yeah, some- They're looking good, they're looking good. Thank you, sir. I have some data on my phone, so I had to switch, quickly switch to that. But the disadvantage okay. of that is that um, even the, the material I got that I wanted to share is on the laptop. However, let's just go on and see how far God will take us tonight. Um, I, I, I want to give, I just want us to discuss three things on church movements. Uh, Brother Abraham, please, could you just mute you, you are, you, your movement? Is yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. The thing has still unmuted you. Wow. Okay, it's muted now. So yes. Okay. So um, I I want to to give a brief, just a brief history of some movements in the church and how these movements at various times have impacted the history of the church. And then I, I also want us to look at how this uh, uh, was happening. Bra Abraham, you are back on. Let me try and see. I think, let me try and see if I can mute him as well. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Yes. Okay. So some of these movements have impacted the church yes. and that has impacted the church very, very powerfully uh, uh, over the years. Now, the first movement that I would talk about is the, okay, the first ideology don't let, uh, that created a movement that I will talk about is the ideology of monasteries, monasteries. And um, how did this all started? Now, we, we see that basically among the Catholics today, we have the monasteries, we have the one for the men, we have the nunneries for the women, and then we have the concept of celibacy and all of those things. Now, so, some church historians have argued that so most of these things have their origin in uh, paganism, that is the Roman paganism of the time. Maybe it could have some, some influence of paganism, but I beg to, to, to differ slightly in that. So, uh, for monasteries or the movement of what, what eventually became uh, uh, what we see in that culture uh, today, it started with a post-persecution effect. Now, the, the Christians were persecuted at the time and a number of people were killed. They were, they were regarded as the martyrs. And the beauty of the way they faced death really amazed a number of non-Christians. And even because of that, many of these non-Christians became Christians because of the way the, the, the church then faced death. So after a while, when persecution ceased, um, many of the stories of those who were killed, these martyrs, uh, those who died for the faith, many of their stories became devotionals and inspiration for a lot of later Christians. In fact, they became admirable uh, or they, they admired a number of them that they could hold on to Christ until the point of death. So because of that, when persecution was no longer there, there was the concept of the willingness to die for Christ. At the time when church people were persecuted intermittently, there were people who even wished that they would be killed and were willing to give their life over to Christ. I think um, one of them was John Calvin, who was willing to, I'm not John Calvin now, but Martin Luther, who was willing to even die, the die of a martyr and all of that. So because that was not available, the concept of what we call white martyrdom came up when people decided to, to live as if they were dead even though they were not beheaded or they were not dead. So they put themselves in, in, position, in the position of the dead. Like they no longer relate with the people. They no longer do those normal things that an average normal human being will do because they wanted to assume the position of death. And so that built up an ideology and the ideology is what we call self martyrdom or white martyrdom that people kill themselves, not by taking poison or killing themselves physically, but they put themselves in a position of being dead. That those things, they don't allow those things that normally will appeal to any man to appeal to them. So it is built on this that we have all the concepts of celibacy. Um, though a number of people also refer to teachings of Christ that some are Enoch, by birth, some were uh, Enoch because they made themselves for the sake of the kingdom, and uh, some are uh, Enoch made by men. So a lot of things came up, but the idea I want to present to us tonight is that there was this movement of people who separated themselves from the world. Even though they were not persecuted, they were not killed, they didn't live at a time that they could suffer martyrdom, but they decided that they want to experience martyrdom the way their heroes of faith has experienced it. So that became a movement. And what was the impact of this movement? It was the foundation for what I call the, 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 uh, uh, 
the holiness movement. Now I've forgotten the um, the Puritan movement. Yes, it was the foundation for the Puritan movement. People who believe in purity, who believe in holiness, people who will separate themselves from the old world for any reason. Now, there, there were the extreme application of this ideology where people actually get out from among their people, they go into the wilderness and they live there all their lives and they, 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 they will survive on anything. And they, they, you know, it was terrible. But also there, there is the, the people who believe that that is going too far but rather they should, they should exercise self-control in everything around them. So, and mod, mod, moderacy or moderation was one of their watchword. So they will not seek to be very rich. They will not seek to be very powerful, they will not seek to be very open to people and all of that. So they, it, it became an ideology in the church that became foundational to the faith of the holiness movement. Then beyond that, another group that I want to talk about is at Crusaders. Now the Crusaders were, were Catholics, knights, and um, they were men who gave up their, who signed up to fight to defend the extinction of Christianity. Now, at a particular time in the history of the church, the Osman Empire began to encroach terribly into the West, and they were sacking many Christian, um, many Christian cities and towns, and they were taking it over and making and enforcing Islam in those places. They went on, and they would have, they would, their, their goal was to capture as far as Rome, the center of Christianity in the West at that time. So it was these crusaders who came together and said, okay, by their own ideology, believe that it was time to defend the land and defend the faith, defend Christianity against the encroachment of Islam, particularly Islam, um, that were, was spreading on the arms of um, war by the power of, 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 of war and, and, and that. So they, they came together from a very formidable army and they resisted the spread of Islam such that they pushed Islam back. You will remember that all the seven churches that were addressed in the book of Revelation are located in present day Turkey. And all of this, I mean, the entire land today where these churches were are now Islam. Thanks to the Crusaders, maybe Great Britain, including Rome today, would have been strong Islamic centers. But what were the downsides of the Crusaders? The downside of it was that many of them did not have the faith of Christ, but they fought for Christ. Some way, somehow, they thought they were fighting for Christianity, whereas they didn't actually Many of them didn't actually understood what Christianity was. Now, I may, I may be too, too, how do I call it? This may be a blanket statement, which may not be very correct, but then their faith, maybe I should rather talk of their faith rather than talk of, the, the, their faith was one that permitted the defending of the faith of, uh, of Christianity through the use of um, arms. And they did well. I, I mean, at least they stopped the spread of uh, Islam in the West. Otherwise, all uh, where we have France, um, where we have Germany, and all of that today, including Great Britain, have been under the control of the Muslims from. It was a terrible, terrible time. The way history reported it, that this um, cluster, I mean, this group.
Saints, uh, pardon me for now, the elect of God. So, uh, mm -hmm. the, but then we cannot throw out the fact that one of the great which is still in history today, but one of the Islam towards the North, I mean, towards the West. Otherwise, the, the caliphates, the, the, the Islam leaders, Islamic leaders would have override the entire West. Then another ideology in the history of the church that I will want us to also have an holiness movement. It did not just start with the, the evangelicals. There were tens of holiness ideology right from the, the, the third century AD, AD, history of the church, where we have people who believe in separation, who believe that they ought to do something to show that they are responsible recipients of the, of the salvation that is made available for them in Christ. You will, have, you, will now, you, you will now appreciate the fact that a number of the evangelical preachers began to emphasize faith as against work. And we can even see a taint of this in the New Testament time when the New Testament writers like Paul spoke expressly on the fact that it is not by works that we are saved, but by faith. So the holiness movement is an, is, 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 is an ideology that came up to prove that human beings ought to be responsible. Now, we have a lot of that. I mean, we have a suggestion of that in the scriptures where we are told to be responsible Christians, but then the real challenge with the holiness movement at their various degrees is that it puts at jeopardy the essential of our Christian faith, which is salvation by faith, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And over the years, a number of people or scholars have tried to define the limits. Where, where does faith end and work begin or works begin? I mean, would I say, like in the book of James, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. Will I say I have faith and then not live as an irresponsible Christian? Then how responsible can I be in the face of faith? So these are very crucial things that uh, Christian theologians, doctrine uh, teachers, doctrinal teachers and all of that are finding very difficult to place. So if I say, okay, it is by faith we are saved. Great, we all agree it is by faith that we are saved. But then where is the place of me, be my obedience? If it is by faith, do I still have the latitude to do certain things? I see an upsurge of grace today. And that is a rebellion or a, a, a move against the holiness movement. One of it is what we have today, the grace philosophy or the grace theology. They say, by the grace of God is sufficient for us in all things. That means you, you, once you are saved, you can live all by yourself. And, and, and it goes on and on. So the holiness movement had a great impact on the evangelicals. And that is why when the evangelicals came on board, they, because of their holiness inclination or background, they began to hold on to two things. One, being a responsible recipient of the grace of God, which is shown in our holy, holy life and commitment to the ways and, and, and laws of God. That's on one hand. And on the other hand, our taking of that gospel of grace and truth to the entire world. That, that is what makes, makes them evangelicals. Now, so this holiness movement grew very fast and we have a taint of it across 
the history of the church, where people lay emphasis on obedience with one um, at one level or the other. The, 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 uh, I, I, I don't know how to preface, but you just find that there is that teaching. You, if you read through the New Testament itself, you find people in the New Testament writers will say, look, you not those who call me Lord, Lord, the words of Jesus, but those who do. So the concept of doing, the concept of obedience, the concept of purity, piety, and all of that became a whole lot of doctrine that the this holiness movement built up. So perfect as it is, yet, it cannot be dragged too far because if you lay emphasis on, 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 on the acts of the people too much, you are likely to destroy the, the, the foundation of faith. And this is what I mean. If, if I lay too much emphasis on what I am able to do, maybe because I do not steal, I do not commit adultery, I do not wrong people, I, I do not do this, I do not do that, if I think because of that I am saved, I have missed the point. But at the same time, I cannot believe in Christ, hold on to the grace that I have in Christ, and continue to do these vices or get involved in these vices that are detrimental to the faith. So you see that there must be a balancing. There's a church in Nigeria that teaches or preaches this holiness thing. And I also believe it, but it cannot be dragged too much because when you lay too much emphasis on what people should do, what people should be, rather than laying emphasis on the grace we have received through the Holy Spirit, you are likely to create hypocrites because you find people who will, who will um, pretend they are what you want them to be while you are, in the, you are there, but the moment you leave and they are alone, they revert back to the real things that they have. And that is hypocritical. Now, so I often tell people, there must be what we call gradual development by the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, which every, every Christian must experience. And that's what we call maturity, maturity in faith. We must allow people grow at their faith, at their pace, without imposing on them too many laws. But we must introduce them to the spirit of Christ, to the Holy Spirit, who has the ability to take them one step after the other until they get to where they are going. Now, when, the, the, then the last one, or maybe let me just talk about, is the evangelical Pentecostal movement of America and its impact on the world. Now, evangelical in the sense that they believe in carrying the message across to the world. But Pentecostal in the sense that they hold on strongly to the manifestation of the giftings of the spirit. And this started in the late 1800s up into the 1900s up until the 21st century. Now, let me, let me, let me uh, uh, paint a picture of what this looks like. You remember that there were so many prayer groups. We have the Faith Tabernacle, we have the Precious Stone, we have so many of the prayer groups that were in the world at that time. And these were evangelical Pentecostal movements. They were evangelical in the sense that they believe in going out with the gospel, they believe in practicing holiness, yet they believe in the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit. They had their impact on Nigeria, which I will mention in a short time. But in North America came this ideology that there can be the, the, the that Christianity comes with power. Christianity comes with the manifestation of the giftings of grace. And that is the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Now it is out of this ideology that we find so many movements, such as the Baptist Church, the, ev the evangelical movement, such as the Baptist Church, such as the uh, um, God uh, uh, Four Square um, Church of God Mission, you know, uh, Assembly of God, and all of those who believe in the Holy Spirit, 
yet they are evangelical, they are outfit. Now, that ideology came out having a merger of all the holiness movement, what the holiness movement start, stands for, what evangelicalism stands for, and what Pentecostalism also represents. Now, I see that as a respite that God has given the world for a real opportunity for balance. Because the true balance, in my own opinion, is that we must be thoroughly evangelical, we must be thoroughly Pentecostal, and we must be thoroughly, uh, we must have the holiness kind of ideology where we do what we should and what we can, where we also depend greatly on the Holy Spirit and we are committed to spreading the gospel. Now, because of this act, a number of teachings began to grow up. And from there, we have the Neo-Pentecostal movement. Now, the Neo-Pentecostal movement is a serious departure from what traditional Pentecostalism represents. The Neo-Pentecostal movement obviously believe more in the application of the giftings and the powers inherent in the Holy Spirit for the benefit of man. Now, that is the difference, for the benefit of man. That is, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. What advantages or what good will that bring into your life and thus help you to bring into the lives of other people? And when we talk of this good, it is not primarily good that uh, that, that is uh, according to the God's definition of good, but according to man's definition of good. Let me give you some part of it, some, some example. For instance, if you have the Holy Spirit, how much of people can, I, I mean, how can you effect healing? How can you effect breakthrough? How can you effect deliverance and all of that? And gradually, the thing began to move away from an even God-centered kind of use of the giftings of the Holy Spirit to a man-centered desire, I mean, uh, 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 fulfilling the desires of man. It's a very, very tight, uh, a very thin thing to, 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 to break, to show the difference. Now, gradually we move from a, a people who are heaven conscious to a people who are are hardly minded, we do all things. So pray. Became necessary because of what you want to get. Heroes of the Pentecostals or leaders of the Pentecostal movement at this time are extremely, in my opinion, I of it is that they are more conscious now than preparing a people for the for the whole for for, the, for eternity and so we have so from From there came a group energy. Now the motive essential can push a man to tap into the energies within him or the potentials within him and achieve some great feats in life. Teachings that are motivational get because good things have their principles in Christ, then they, they also back it up with scriptures because Christ-centered life, but it's sad. Uh,
enterprise of the motivation behind the church. So we find a number of people, they say a lot of things, but they say it from a humanistic point of view, not from a Christ-like, Christocentric point of view. And I want to warn tonight, this is not just a discussion meant to excite us, but for us to understand and know what to pray about, and know also how we will teach and train or disciple younger people for the gospel tomorrow. This movement has pervaded the entire, um, the, 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 the entire Christian, uh, what, what do you call it now, the entire Christian world of today. In Nigeria, we find a reflection of this Pentecostal movement with the huge competition that we have among the fathers of the Pentecostal church today. Just today or yesterday, we were discussing a, we were discussing in, in a class that I took the impact of the Pentecostal church. Well, I mean, the church is huge. Our, our churches are rich, yet the impact of that church on the, 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 the citizenship or the citizen, citizenry of Nigeria is very small. Corruption is high. People are discontented. An average, I'm so sorry to say this, but an average Christian, just ordinary churchgoer, if you employ them, they, they, they steal from you. They do almost every evil thing that you don't expect a man who has been to church to do. And these people go to church and prophesy. They go to church, raise up hands and speak in tongues, yet right in them has not been entrenched the principles of Christ. So what then are they learning in church? So today we look, we see that right here today, we have the largest uh, single sitting auditorium, uh, church auditorium in the world, in Nigeria, which some say is the uh, Paul Enides church in Abuja. I was told also that, um, uh, uh, Brother David Dibiome is building something larger. Then I got to also understand that the ark being built by winners is going to be the largest in the world. So which means we're very soon in a couple of years time, we're probably going to see one or two other church auditoriums that are larger than that of um, Paul and Nietzsche. And then it brings to question, the resources, the energy, the timing that goes into the constructions of these things, which is meant just for enhancement, how much of its impact is seen in the culture of the people and in the lives of those who follow them as Christians. Now, I, I'm not here to condemn what they are doing uh, or what uh, the building of it, but I think is a, in my own opinion, I think is a misplacement of priority because we need to put more emphasis, more, more resources into training people. We, we have gone this way before. You remember, if you have read anything about Agil Sophia in, 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 in present day Turkey, it was the most beautiful church edifice in its own time. But today it is a museum. At the time it was a mosque, but it was built with add end income of the faithfuls, church people, people who believe in Christ, and but they cannot skip it. So my real, real challenge is why do we build Ephesus without building the people who will have the capacity to keep those edifices alive after we are gone? Look, if you don't give birth to a movement that will survive the next 200 years, then you have not succeeded. Because what we need is not the building of cathedrals, but the building of ideologies, the building of movements that will outlive us. Look at the holiness movement. It has been for over 500 years, at least well-defined. Look at all of these movements that we mentioned tonight. Some of them still have their impact on us today. The, 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 the kind of Christianity that Paul preached gave birth to what we are holding on to today. So what are we doing about that? Paul did not build a cathedral. Peter did not build one. 
uh, but their impact is still felt today because it laid emphasis on certain core things that will affect humanity as against those mundane things that was to enhance our gospel. I pray that God will give us wisdom. So today we have Nigerians who are doing very well and it is in, Nigeria is the most religious um, nation in the world today, yet we are not the, 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 the best nation to desire to live in. Then it means there's something wrong with our religion. So these are basic movements. Now there's another movement that I must mention, which is the what we call the reformed church or the reformed ideology. Now the reformed ideology also have various uh, uh, versions, various versions of the, but the main idea or idea of the reformed ideology is talking of a people whose real interest is a Christ-centered life, that's what they, they push, and they criticize every movement that will not conform to the teachings of Bible. Now the reform movement also have a way of having certain literal or direct interpretation of the scriptures. And anything outside that is criticized and unacceptable. Now, I'm a reformed, uh, I, uh, but, but I am reformed in essence, but then I, I, I do not, one of the things I don't really subscribe to, I love their, their doctrine of holiness. I love their doctrine of evangelism. I love their doctrine of commitment. I love their doctrine of Christ-centeredness. I love their understanding of the impact of the Holy Spirit. And then I love their doctrine of faith, even though there are several versions of it. However, one thing I don't like about the current day reformed movement is they are quick, they are being quick to criticize and pull down anybody doing any other thing but them. Uh, now, I, I don't believe that we should go all out. Yes, we can mention, I, I, you, you, you can mention in love, which many of the reformed brothers do, mention in love what you see that others are doing wrong. But I pray God will give us wisdom. So the reformed movement is there, the evangelical movement, which is also an evangelical movement. We have the Pentecostal, we have the new Pentecostal, and all of these movements present certain ideologies that live after them. Now, an ideology from a particular movement today could evolve to form another movement in the, near, in, in, in the future, which we've also come whether by reason of addition or subtraction, a whole new ideology which the church holds on to. But then I want us to I want to underscore this as I stop tonight, that the main ideology that is required for us to carry on this life of Christ. And I'm going to be talking about this a little bit to, uh, uh, next week, which I hope will be the last of this session, if possible. Yeah, and that is the ideology of a Christ-centered life, where everything you do, everything you say, who you are, what you're going to be, what you don't want to be, is all centered on the person and impact of Christ over your life. What we do, what we don't do, all because of Christ. So that has been the foundation and the leveling ground for every movement in the history of the church. And you find out that as people deviate because of one ideology or the other, they are pulled back to position by their understanding of who Christ is, what he did for us on the cross, and our position in relying on and being responsible to that that Jesus did. So Christ-centered life, the Christocentric doctrine, is the only thing that has survived and we continue to survive till eternity because the word says that upon this, he will build his church. And what is that? Upon the confession that you are the Christ. 
the son of the most of the living God. And because he is the Christ, every other ideology, every other uh, foundations will crumble. But that which is built on Christ will be forever. For the Bible says, no other foundation can any one man lay except that which is laid already. And we are to build on it. My encouragement to people is always that let us seek to build on that Christ so that whatever we will do, we stand the test of time. So I'm going to stop here tonight. The Lord bless you. If there are questions, if there are observations or comments, then we take it up from there. But by the grace of God next week, I am going to be sharing with us the mandate of the church, the real mandate of the church. And I believe it's going to be an eye opener because this, when it came to me, was an eye opener. We will see how little we are doing as a church and how much we can do when we begin to pray and do our own part. God bless you all, sirs and mass. Wow. Dr. Kayode, it's always a pleasure to drink from your well of knowledge, your experience, and, um, and your learning. I, I really was enjoying that. I didn't know that uh, time had gone so much. I, I was just engrossed in uh, what I was listening to. It was as you were drawing the curtains that I looked up and I saw that we're almost um, 10 o'clock. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. I mean, this was this delivered with simplicity and with, uh, but I want to just draw. I don't know whether we'll have one or two people just share their comments, but two or three things struck me particularly in the things that you said. Uh, the first one is that um, the reason that you are teaching and bringing forth these things is not so much that we accumulate knowledge, but that, you know, you are looking at us as people that God will send out into the world and that we have to have this knowledge so that, you know, when we now, by the grace of God, begin to train disciples, we will know how to avoid the errors and then know what to stick to and, um, uh, and build on that. Now, the other thing that struck me was um, what you said about, you know, knowing the errors so that we can, we can actually stay upon the right path. You spoke about the cathedrals and all of the places that the church has been before and um, how and why, you know, in our own time, uh, what is important is that we look for the core of the doctrine of Christ and build on that because that is what lasts eternally. And the Bible says the day will reveal it, you know. So it means that a day is coming when all of these things are going to be evaluated. And the things that will last are the things that, um, and the thing, are the things that uh, Christ approves of. Now, the other thing that came to me as you were teaching was the word that Jesus said that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, the freedom that I speak about, you know, as this scripture came to me, is that we then have liberty, liberty of discerning, liberty of knowledge, liberty of knowing, you know, first of all, that we are in the faith and that, you know, by the, by the, by the, by the help of these teachings, we are also able to judge the work of our hands and the leaning of the works of our hands to see in what directions that we are going. So I believe that the benefit of knowledge cannot be overemphasized. So once again, I want to say thank you very much, sir, for these things, this knowledge that you have brought to us. Brethren, you've been listening to Dr. Kayode. Some people sent some comment, some messages on the chat that they couldn't come in because of the network. Um, we thank God. I don't know. It's all over the country, just here and there. Just bless God that, you know, with Pastor Kaya Days, he threw me out about two or three times, you know, when he was speaking. So, but thank God that, you know, I, I, I'm able to even manage this length of speaking after Dr. Kaya has spoken. So, brethren, you want to just make a comment or you want to ask a question? Uh, I think we can, we can take, um, we can take a few questions. Um, 
So you want to do that, please just unmute and uh, speak. Uh, ask your question or make your comment so that the entire thing can be enriched. Brethren, so many things were touched. He spoke about motivational teachings. He spoke about how, you know, the new Pentecostalism. Yes, okay. All right, Sister Tessie. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, Brother Kaide for this teaching. I think my eyes have been cleared, especially about the monastery, the, the ideology behind the monastery and the non 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 as he called it. Initially, we have thought it was. Um, like a false doctrine or some kind of a pagan, pagan worship, or you know that those kind of thing. But you threw so much light on it now, and I'm really, really glad about that. In fact, the way I see it is like it's like it. This is like this um, foundation for death to self message I would preach now, and I think that's like just a foundation for it. I don't know, but it's really clear to me that. The Lord was teaching something on that to those people of those of, the, of those times. Mm -hmm. This that yeah. monastery, this non non uh, nuns and all that at those times, you know. But you know, in our time, when we are talking to Catholics, is like as though they went into pagan stuff and they are doing some kind of things that is not even in scriptures. But it's from what you have, you have spoken, I can get the story. I can get the 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 life, the core. The, the passion, the love for Christ and all that that you're talking about. And I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Brother Karade. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Yes, but also I must emphasize, Ma, that um, the, the, when we talk of the origin of it, doesn't mean that the way it is practiced today, that it is correct. So, um, yes. Yes. Yeah. so the, for everything that has a good intention for a start. Over the years, people abuse it. Uh, I, I was shocked Very in 1996 when I visited a, a particular friend. We, I mean, visited a, a pastor, no, um, what do you call a priest with a friend. And uh, I discovered that the priest was someone I knew who has his wife near my house in Ilorin. I was shocked. Uh -uh. So, but he's out in that place outside the lorry where we went for a crusade and went to visit him. And we discovered that the same man who used to come to my neighborhood, his wife is there, we know him. <laughs> and here, meet him. At the coast. So, there, he's, he doesn't have a wife, he's everything. But in the lorry here, his wife is there, my neighbor. And um, so, he was shocked to see me too because I we knew each other very well, but I never knew he was a priest, never, until I went to do program in that city, and they took me to go and greet one of the prominent fathers in the place, and there he was. Mm. Can you imagine? So, so the, just as we have those who are abusive, we have those who are faithful to it, but the whole idea is that people yes. who want to experience death. And they said, look, if they can't kill me, I can kill myself for the sake of Christ by denying myself of all of these yeah. things. And it's a wonderful thing to a place to be if yeah. we are really engraced to do it. Thank you, Ma. Yes. Praise the well, Lord. it also looked to me like um, it looked to me like um, a fleshly manifestation of what ought to be spiritual. Uh, what yes, the sir. grace of God working in the life of the man actually ought to be able to help him to achieve as he desires it. Brad Chima, please come on. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My only question, uh, Dr. Kaude mentioned a, a lot of Christian and spiritual movement, which ended in reformation movement. And um, he said, uh, all their belief and doctrine is fantastic uh, because they are 
strictly to the scripture, but he says something about they are easily to criticize and judge others. So my question is, these people which I would like to fall in such movement that criticize, I think Bible asks us to judge every spirit. So if they are criticizing by reason of the light of the scripture, that this thing, this is the way by this is the way these people are going with it. And people are following it. Does it mean they are wrong? Because I've been the immersion churches, as I am, I'm not even ready for all this denomination because I can't, because something they are doing is not scriptural. It's not those one million mansion and, but why I'm not criticizing them because I'm not the one that called them. If they say that God, God is the one that God bless that, you, sir. God, you have answered the question, sir. <laughs> oh, but you ask me into such a thing, I cannot. So this reformation movement, which area do they need amendment in that move to align with the word of God and the spirit of God? Where we know Peter operate, Paul operate, that brought this light to us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank Hallelujah. you so much, Brother Chima. Before uh, Brother Rotimi will talk, let me quickly say one thing. The, the beauty of the Reformed Church is that they want to measure everything based on the Bible, and I love it. But you yeah. see, for every situation like that, even my interpretation of the scripture sometimes could be subjective, could be the way I see it. So I have no right to say everybody is going to hell except me and my people. And when we have some reformed brethren who have gone to that extreme, of course, we have those of us who are balanced, who believe that, look, um, uh, we need to tell the truth in love to people. And the greatest love you can show to any man is to tell him if he's wrong so that he can correct his error. Beautiful. However, the balance to all these things is that we don't make people our subject of message all the time. So that every time we come up, we're either talking of Brother Rotimi or talking hey. of Brother Kate or talking of Brother well, Chima or talking. Well, no, 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 no. Where is the gospel of Christ? And that is why I ended it up that the best and balanced thing that will stand the test of time is when we all dovetail into that central message, which is the mm. message of Christ, the way Christ will give it to us. And I believe that God will give us understanding. Thank you so much, Brother Chima, for bringing light to that. Mm. Thank you. We can take one more comment, brethren, and then we close. If there's any one more comment. Those, those contributions were excellent. <clears throat> now, just maybe to substantiate what uh, Dr. Kayade said, you know, his last comment. Uh, when we see in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, we keep seeing that, and they preached Christ, and they preached Christ. And um, what they preached, the Christ that they preached uh, became the power of the gospel and the impact, you know, you know, for the gospel to spread and spread and spread. And in the preaching of Christ, you know, it was attended by miracles, demonstrations of the miraculous, you know. So everywhere Paul went, he was preaching Christ. Everywhere the other apostles went, they were preaching Christ. So I think that, well, God, church is coming back full circle. As a matter of fact, listening to you uh, from the reformation of uh, Martin Luther, and then, you know, they just, you know, started with faith and then all of these things opening up into evangelism, opening up further into power and all of that, you know, all of these manifestations. It's as if the Lord just uh, started recovering his church uh, slowly and steadily, you know, from what 
from the fire that started with the reformation will come on a massive scale again upon this. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the blood. You know, God is just inching of this Jesus the Christ, making him the center of our gospel and the center of our message. We will now get back to a point where the entire world will be recovered for Christ. Thank you so very much. Uh, without any more comment, I think it's a good place to leave it. And um, we just will thank Dr. Kayaje again. And then the people who brought in the different comments, we really appreciate the comments that came in this afternoon. Um, Pastor Kayaje was already signing off that next week will be the last uh, installment of all of these teachings. Well, we thank God for the number of weeks that um, we have had with him. And then let us see what happens. <laughs> Let us just see what happens. Um, but we will be here next week by the grace of God. And we just trust God that, um, you know, like I said, these, these teachings are so enriching. And my joy is that they are recorded and they are stored. So that even if, if others were to join the platform tomorrow, we might not necessarily have to ask you to come and do these teachings again. All we have to do is just point them, you know, to the teachings that you have done and they can continue to be blessings unto generations. But this is not going to be the last that you're going to be teaching. Uh, there'll be more contemporary things that you're going to look at. Because one thing I like about you, and you know, it's not because I'm, I'm, uh, you are teaching tonight, um, the balance, you know, from the time that I knew you, what struck me was um, your attention to balance in Christianity. And I think, you know, it's a lesson that we can learn from you that in all things, you know, we have to be careful to understand where the limits are so that, you know, we don't veer off, you know, and stay a steady course, you know. Uh, the Bible talks about running the race that is set before us, that we don't go into the byways, we don't go into the corners, we don't go, you know, we don't go circumventing the things that the Lord has laid down. And so I, on this note, I want to say thank you again, and thank you for everyone that came on tonight uh, because of time, I don't want to begin to mention names individually. Um, we just have, um, we have, um, that sister Choma, Choma she's still on, still on. and she give us the closing prayer, and then we share the grace. Sister Choma. Wow. Brother Jemine, are you there? If uh, she's not uh, unmuted. Brother Jemine, please. Sir. Sorry, I'm in a noisy place, sir. Good evening, sir. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. How are you, sir? Okay, so, bro. Fine, thank you. No comments, really, sir. Did you say you're in a noisy place? Yes, sir, but I can hear you. Okay, no all right. So, Brajamine, please go ahead. Brother Jamine, please. Can we have you? Oh, wow. I thought my gem not just unmuted. Okay, Sister Tessie, if you can unmute quick, quickly, can you please um, assist us? The closing prayer. Please unmute. All right, in the name of Jesus. Hmm. Father, we bless your name. Lord, we give you glory, we give you honor. We thank you because yeah. you are God. And you are a great God. We worship. Thank you. So very. Wow. 
Wow. We are the one, sister. Let's see. Father, we just thank you for bringing us to the end of the meetings today. We give you glory and honor. We thank you, oh God, for the, the, for, the, for the word that has been shared and for the message that has come forth. Thank you, Father, because this shall impact our lives positively to the glory of your name. We pray, oh God, for each and every one of us that in the commission that you have given unto us for our individual, we will walk upon the straight and the narrow. Father, careful, oh God, not to go into the byways. And Lord, careful, oh God, to be sure that we walk to your own satisfaction. Father, give us this grace and cause it yeah. to be that the zeal of the Lord of hope now perfect it in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we sanctify ourselves unto you. All our brethren, we pray for them that your blessing will touch them, oh God. And as many as get to hear this message later, let the blessings of the message be richly imparted upon their lives in the name of Jesus. We return our glory and honor unto you. In Jesus' name, we thank you, O God, for your messenger, that you will visit him, you will touch him, you will bless him, you will enlarge him, you will, Lord of glory, open up more vistas unto him, to the glory of your name. Thank you, mm -hmm. Father, for all things. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Let's share the grace, brethren. The grace thank of our you. Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Goodness. Amen.